Long before cell phones, automobiles, and air conditioning, there was the land and a hardy bunch of frontier-taming folks who toiled to raise homes, farms, and families. Remembering and honoring these forebearers is part of the mission of the Ames Plantation. Today's Ames Plantation consists of around 18,600 acres. And we're very fortunate in that that land base, which is almost 10 miles across, to give you some perspective there, that land base is very rich with a history of western Tennessee. The trustees of the Hobart Ames Foundation of today feel like as stewards of that land holding, they have a responsibility to take the steps necessary to preserve the cultural component on the landscape. You know, the land has a rich history going back over 180 years and that history doesn't belong to the Ames Plantation. Uh, it in effect belongs to every resident of this area. It's a part of the cultural heritage of southwestern Tennessee. Encompassing 18,600 acres across Hardeman and Fayette counties, the plantation is overseen by a foundation and managed by the University of Tennessee. This agriculture experiment station includes 12,000 acres of forest, 2,000 acres of commodity row crops, the fourth oldest registered herd of Angus beef cattle, and 40 head of horses. Flight conditioned quail are also raised here. The Ames Plantation uh, began in 1901 when Mr. Hobart Ames and his wife, Julia Colony Ames, from uh, the Boston area, purchased some land here in western Tennessee that was to become a sort of a getaway for them. Uh, they were interested in uh, quail hunting, and uh, this area at that point in time was home to a number of other, quote, plantations that were devoted to wildlife and quail in particular. So it was a natural fit for them, and they bought land from 1901 until 1936, amassing approximately 25,000 acres of land. This area was originally open to settlers in 1818 when the land was bought from the Chickasaw Indians through the Jackson Purchase. The main house at Ames was built by John Walker Jones in 1847. It was known as Cedar Grove and was one of several successful cotton plantations until the Civil War. During the war, the North meticulously mapped this region and mustered here. After the Civil War, sharecropping and tenant farming fueled the area's economy. Preserving this rich history at Ames includes the restoration of 26 family cemeteries, over 200 historical sites, and many original buildings. We took all of these buildings from different locations uh, on the plantation property, and we moved them here and restore them on this central location in an arrangement that is fairly typical of the antebellum uh, family farmstead. Each of the buildings represent farm living and working. School kids enjoy a hands-on experience of what it took to survive in 19th century West Tennessee. In October, the public is invited to the annual Heritage Festival to learn about and enjoy the skills and necessities of frontier living. It gives the teachers an opportunity to get out of the textbook and out of the classroom and actually uh, to get out in the field and, and have the children see how their ancestors lived. So all of that tied together is what we call the, uh, the cultural resource program here at the Ames Plantation. Our story today also includes an unusual addition to the Heritage Restoration Program, a rescued home referred to as the Stencil House. The home was built in the 1830s in Wayne County near the town of Clifton. It is a one-and-a-half-story dog-trot-style log cabin, quickly updated by the addition of exterior lumber and interior walls of tongue-and-groove poplar boards or horsehair plaster. But it is also a unique example of the early decorative art of stencil painting. The history of stenciling, of this particular stenciling, is that it really originated in eastern Massachusetts. It, uh, these particular stencilers did not uh, develop stenciling. Stenciling's been known since the Middle Ages. It was used on everything from uh, altar screens to playing cards. But they did, in the 1790s, late 18th century in eastern Massachusetts, develop this particular stenciling and it's called the folk group or the folk genre of wall stenciling. The stenciled designs in the house belong to the famous painter Moses Eaton Sr. Those designs were taken to other regions of the country by his son, Moses Eaton Jr. 
Stenciling was done by itinerant painters who traveled with their materials and painted as hired. This particular artist uh, is unusual in that he used this overall sponging technique everywhere. And he used it on walls and on the ceiling. Moses Eaton Jr. is not known for that. Um, he also used the sponging technique under the willow tree, which is a convention that Moses Eaton Jr. used. Uh, usually the wall stenciling would be broken up in panels like this, would have a border or frieze like wallpaper of the period, would have the, the upright motifs, which would, would uh, be somewhat you know, scaled to wallpaper, and it would usually have the dado piece above the chair rail too, and would kind of break that space up. But this, this artist also would just use borders and um, he also would just sponge whole walls, maybe just a board or two, so he's a little atypical in that. The stencil designs tell a story or represent a general mood. The pineapple is the symbol of hospitality. The willow represents immortality or eternal life, and the flower spray symbolizes affection and love. This particular decoration um, and stenciling and, and this neoclassical decoration really is a result of um, the men, a lot of the men coming home from the Revolutionary War. This is the federal period, the period really where these motifs kind of symbolize home. The men are coming home ready to establish families. It's kind of like our GIs coming home after World War II. They're really ready to make, settle down and make roots. And a lot of the motifs you see, like the oak leaf border, you know, these are just traditional symbols of home and family and strength. And a lot of the things these men, you know, we're known for in their service to our country. Stencil painters borrowed heavily from wallpaper designs, but by 1850, stenciling had fallen out of favor as wallpaper became more affordable and the stencil designs more formalized by Victorian influence. The stencil house doesn't tie directly to the history of the Ames land base. The stencil house was moved here from Wayne County, Tennessee, which is about 100 miles to the east. By adding the stencil house, even though it came from some distance away, it gives us the opportunity to add diversity to what we have to offer as an educational uh, program here at the Ames Plantation. The stencil house brings with it the folk art of stenciling, which is something that, uh, while it may very well have existed here in this particular area, uh, has not survived. And stenciling, uh, as a folk art, of course, uh, it is uh, unique to what we have. Uh, it also allows us the opportunity to see the kinds of structures, the architectural style, for example, that was being used in maybe not this immediate area, but in areas that were very closely related uh, in adjacent counties. Uh, it, it, just, it gives us the opportunity, once again, to, uh, to show a broader scope of the cultural heritage that was going on in the region as a whole. The stencil house was continually occupied until 1970 and had then fallen to near ruin. Some repairs and preparation were required before the house could be moved to the Ames Plantation. Too wide for the country roads, the house had to be literally dug out of its Wayne County roots. State, county, and local officials helped clear the path for its trip to Fayette County. With the help of grants and individual donations, chimneys, porches, and other external features will be replaced and then the delicate and expensive work of restoring the stencil decor can begin. First thing, the paint analysis has to be done. We've got to know what the paint's made out of so we all know how to treat it. And uh, once that's done, the paint analyst or conservator can give a recommendation or a program for treatment. And that's just something that'll be very time consuming and labor intensive. It's a lot of, of wall space. Um, Paint conservation is really well known, like in easel paintings, where if you have an easel painting worth millions of dollars, you know, it makes a lot of sense to clean a painting and spend a lot of time on it. Here in architectural settings, it's a lot more difficult to do. You can't spend that, that kind of time. You have such large areas, so it, it, it's going to be a difficult job, but it can be done. And while the house is important in and of itself from an architectural standpoint, it is truly the stenciling that makes it unique. And, and um, it's really a, it's a treasure. It's a historic treasure that belongs to all Tennesseans. And the, the stenciling is what we're really after. Um, 
So once we have that, what I consider to be the vessel, you know, the, the house that contains the stenciling back in very sound architectural condition, uh, at that point we will approach the stenciling itself. Absolutely, it's worth it. It's a very relevant house. It's a remarkable survivor of really a yeoman's house, a middle class farmer's house in Tennessee. Uh, we see a lot of the plantation homes and the homes of the really famous and the wealthy and, and we really don't have that connection with those people but I think we can all kind of appreciate a more humble house like this and it's a pretty amazing thing to see in Tennessee designs and design transmission from Rome, from Pompeii to London to Boston to rural Massachusetts to Middle Tennessee and to see a person living in the first quarter of the you know, 19th century in Tennessee living in, in pretty much a, a Pompeian interior, interior and I don't know if he was aware of that or not but uh, he probably was.